Hey, before this experience begins, we just want to pause and say thank you for watching this whenever, wherever. And our hope is not that you're just passively consuming this content, but that you are using it in your discipleship journey, that you're sharing this hope with other people. And we want to hear stories of how God is using this in your life. And so you can drop a comment below or email me anytime online at cccomaha.org and we will help you take your best next step. All right, well, I hope you've gotten out your Bibles and turned to General chapter three. If you haven't, there's a Bible under your seat and it's page 615. And now we're gonna be rolling through this passage about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace. Now, I have a little bit of hesitation on this because this and Daniel and the lion's den are two passages that if you've been through Sunday school, kids ministry, watched videos, you've heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you have heard about it with little vegetable characters, like carrots and peas named Rack, Shack, and Benny, and a giant chocolate bunny that they're supposed to bow down and worship. How many people know what I'm talking about with the veggie tales? Yeah, the bunny, the bunny, oh, I love the bunny. I don't love my mom or my dad, just the bunny. In fact, we almost banned that video because our kids were running around the house saying, I don't love my mom or my dad, just the bunny. But my goal today is to take you out of that kid's mindset with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is a great story for kids, by the way, and put you in the adult world of what was happening in their minds and what the applications are for people who can look at them as a model of faith and courage in the midst of the storm. So here we are, Daniel chapter three, beginning at verse one, says this. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. (laughs) Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And that's the end of this reading. (laughs) Sorry, I thought I had one more verse. So the story begins with King Nebi creating a statue in the plain of Dura. Now, we generally imagine that the statue is a statue of the king himself, but the truth is that that Uh, image, we don't actually know. The text doesn't say whether it was King Nebuchadnezzar or one of his gods or something else. We just know that it was an image placed just outside of the city on a plain where lots of people could be able to see the statue and bow down and worship all together. Now, the statue was 60 cubits tall, which in our vernacular is 90 feet tall, and I thought I'd show you just how tall that is. Uh, This is a comparison. This is me right here, me. Uh, This is the Christ Community Globe. This is the Christ Community Cross. This would be how big a 90-foot tall statue would be. So you can imagine, this is a monster-sized statue that he creates. It would be able to be viewed from miles around by people who were approaching the city from the east. Now, the text doesn't say that it is Nebuchadnezzar himself. It might be Marduk, his favorite god. It might have been another god. It really tells us two key things. It tells us what it was made of, which was it was made of uh, uh, gold, and it tells us what its dimensions are. 90 feet high, already, I already mentioned, and nine feet wide. Now, if it was a statue of a human like Nebuchadnezzar, 
the dimensions are not quite right. Because a human being is about four times as tall as it is wide. So it would be like 90 feet high by 22 feet wide. But this one is 10 times as tall as it is wide, so it's really, really skinny. You would imagine a statue like, have you guys been to Council Bluffs and seen the skinny guy statue in Council Bluffs? <laughs> yeah, so you go across 480 and look to your left and you'll see this guy. This is skinny guy right here uh, in our metro. It's actually the most beautiful thing in Council Bluffs. <laughs> and uh, besides the beautiful people who attend Christ Community Church from Council Bluffs, they're the most beautiful. If you get up close, he's covered with pie tins. That's what the metal is on him. It's old pie tins. And I thought, man, if that guy ate that many pies, he would not be skinny guy uh, up there. Well, anyway, you imagine this kind of dimension with a 90-foot statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Now, it doesn't really matter if it was King Nebuchadnezzar or a god or a mule or whatever it was that he set up there. The key point of the story is... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being pressured to worship another god. And whatever the other god is, it's out of bounds for somebody who is a follower of the one true god to worship that god. And this is the pressure in Babylon. Now you and I, we're not that far from Babylon, are we? We live in a culture where there are constant pressures to worship other things besides the one true God. Our culture demands that we bow to idols. There are multi-million dollar advertising machines that are designed to make our affections bow. Political machines designed to make your loyalty bow. Media machines designed to make you bow to sloganized half-truths about reality. And spiritual forces of evil that want to tempt you to bow to the lowest common denominator of immorality and insignificance. All of these things together make up today's Babylon. When the Bible talks about Babylon, it is an ancient city. It is an opponent to God, but it's also a metaphor for all of the evil forces in this world that are combined together to distract us from God or to make us bow down to things that are not really God. Now, I know that there are not statues that are set up in wide plains of Nebraska for us to bow down to and pressure to do that, but idolatry is still rampant. You have to ask yourself a question, how, how do I know if I'm bowing to an idol? How do I know if I've been given to idolatry? Well, your God is whatever you spend the most time thinking about, the most energy planning for, and the most money that you spend. Can you think about what that might be for you? I actually find that money oftentimes is not an idol by itself. It's a means towards other idols. It could be comfort or security or pleasure. It could be status. For some people, it's retirement, socking enough money away so that they can be comfortable for the rest of their lives to never have to earn money again. For others, your idol might have nothing to do with money. It might be about your image. Carefully cultivating pictures of yourself and your life and the joys that you're experiencing in order to make everybody else think that your life is way better than it actually is. Making your reality look better in the public-facing eye than you know it is on the inside. Some people make their gender or their sexuality an idol, obsessing over it lashing out against anybody who does not fully affirm them for whatever behavior or identity they prefer. For others, an idol is relationships, or maybe that one relationship that you would give anything in this world for. For others, it's their kids, or their kids' sports careers. Whenever the worth of something moves higher and higher up your totem pole until it takes priority over everything else, that is the thing that you worship. That's what you say I attribute ultimate value to, and that is the thing that you worship. 
So our first key reflection question today is this. Is there anything in your life that you would ascribe higher worth to than God? Is there anything that you spend more time thinking about, more time obsessing over, more money that's spent on, more affections that are driven towards, more stress in your life given about than God himself? Because Babylon, in so many ways, will demand that you bow down to these things. And we soon find out that our awesome threesome does not bow down to the idol. Verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward, and they denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, drums, organ, electric guitar, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Do you see how provocative these guys are? It's not just an indictment against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's an indictment against the king. These are your rules. These are your people. You set it up. You need to do something about it. They're goading the king. Now, interestingly, three of the four guys get named. You may remember back in Daniel chapter 1, we have Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And Daniel's kind of the leader of the bunch, which makes us ask the question, where's Daniel in all of this? And the answer we can find in chapter 2, verse 49, which says, Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So Daniel was probably taking care of business out at the royal court, and these three were a part of the sage traps and prefects and administrators of Babylon who were required to be out on the field. But when your leader goes away... All of a sudden, you find out what you're made of on the inside. They couldn't hide behind Daniel anymore. I mean, before, Daniel was the one who talked to the administrators. He's the one who interpreted the dreams. He's the one who went to the king on behalf of everybody else. But now your key guy is gone. What happens when your key guy is gone? I find when the leader steps out, it's time to step up. When the leader steps out, it's time to step up. I want you to grab onto this leadership principle because when we get into groups, we tend to assume certain roles. In your community group, there are assigned leaders. In the corporate world, you have uh, bosses. In ministry, you have pastors. But what happens when the leader is gone and the pressure cranks up? In those moments, it's time for ordinary people to step up. Guys, I, I could not be more proud of Sophie and Cooper, who were up here earlier in this, uh, in this service. I mean, they could have said, you know, we used to depend on those people who were seniors last year, who were our rocks that we always looked up to, to be the ones who set the pace spiritually. No, no, no. They said, when the leader steps out, it's time for us to step up into leadership. And it may be true in your community group where, you know, your leader's going to be gone for two weeks. Do you just cancel the meetings? No way. When the leader steps out, it's time for somebody else to step up. Or maybe your boss goes deer hunting for a couple of weeks in the fall. You go, what do you do? Just apathetically sit by and let business happen to you? No, when the leader steps out, it's time to step up. And if you're somebody who is a leader, let me apply this leadership principle to you that I think sometimes it's wise for leaders to go through what I call strategic absences. Now, this is not a dereliction of duty, but it's an opportunity for people around you to experience leadership over a short period of time and grow into that role for the future. Some of you may have noticed that when I preach here, I preach about two-thirds of the time, about 34 sermons per year at Christ Community Church, and I make room for other people, partly because it's really healthy for you to hear other leadership voices, but partly it's a strategic absence because I know when the leader steps out, 
It's time to step up. And so now we have multiple gifted and experienced preachers here at Christ Community Church around the city and around the world. So maybe that's a step that you need to take as a leader to not think of yourself as indispensable in every moment, but to pull yourself away in order to create room for more leaders to grow into that next position. All right, verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, harp, lyre, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image of God, the image I made, well, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Oh, them's fighting words there, isn't it? Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? <laughs> Do you see he's positioning himself as higher and stronger than God? What God could rescue you? Now they could say, well, the same God who interpreted your last two dreams, you ding dong. <laughs> but they don't. Because they know that there are multiple options for God to use whenever you're facing a fire. I want to talk about three options that God uses when you face a fire. Now, I know that you are unlikely to be thrown into a blazing furnace today. But we still face fires in life. You've got a medical issue that threatens you or threatens your baby or your well-being. Or you're on the hot seat of your job. Or you're in a financial crisis or a lawsuit. You've lost a loved one. You're going through a divorce. You're working through a loved one's addictions or bad choices. I want to ask a question. This is like a real show of hands questions. How many of you would say, I'm in the fire right now, or recently I have been through the fire? Raise your hand. If you're in the fire right now, or recently you've been through, yeah, a lot of people have been. If your hand is down, I have a warning for you. <laughs> Fire's coming soon, baby. Because the truth of the matter is the human existence is filled with fires that we wind up going through in life. And if you haven't been one through recently and you're not going through one now, one is coming up pretty soon. So it's great to learn this stuff before you get to the fire. Three options. Option A is this. He will deliver you. God will deliver you from the fire. But what I mean by this is that he'll solve the problem miraculously. Let me give you an example scenario from our life. Some of you remember six years ago, uh, Kelly had a brain tumor, a meningioma, that needed surgery. Now, option A is the option that we prayed for, that God would miraculously heal the tumor and we wouldn't need surgery. And this is what we pray for all the time, isn't it? Like, we want God to solve the problem miraculously for us and win the lottery, get the promotion, have the kid give up the drugs and move home. This is the solution that we want and we pray for, and sometimes God answers through miracles. So we should pursue these things, and we should go after them. But God does something else besides just relieve the pain in these moments when he creates miracles. It also serves as a faith booster, a faith booster. What happens is God does something miraculous. You tell all your friends, you post it on Facebook. Man, the tumor's gone. I've been miraculously healed. Everything has been taken care of. It's wonderful. And you talk about it for a few months or maybe a year or two and life keeps happening and it fades on into the background. And maybe you even start asking some questions. Would that tumor have been gone Anyway, naturally, was that actually maybe some nutrition stuff that I did? Was it something different? And for whatever reason, that booster winds up having an effect that goes down and you settle back into your faith normal in the future. The second option for God is that he will walk with you through the pain. He'll walk with you through the pain. Sometimes he doesn't deliver you from the pain, but he just uses natural processes in order to resolve those issues more slowly. Maybe it's a doctor. Maybe it's nutrition. Maybe it's disciplined spending and saving. 
Maybe the consequences of sin are so painful that they become self-correcting in your life. Now, in all of these, God is still involved, but he takes his time and he doesn't break the laws of nature and physics in order to do his good work. And in the middle of this painful episode, you pray more and you read the Bible more and you ask your friends to pray for you and you immerse yourself in community and you become just very aware of just how broken our world is, how much you need God and how much community is there for you when you need God. It's a powerful thing and what God's doing in the middle of this is not a faith booster, it's a faith deepener. He's taking you to brand new places in your faith journey. And this kind of faith deepening tends to last for a long time. It's a slow burn that transforms your character and stays deep in your soul. Option C is that he will kill you. I should probably say that more gently, like he will allow you to die. But it doesn't follow the pattern so much, so I just put he will kill you on there. And it's just an acknowledgement that sometimes you get the tumor and it doesn't get healed. Sometimes you pray for somebody and they pass away. The truth of the matter is military members still die in battle, loved ones still go to the grave, and sometimes things don't turn out in the way that we would love for them to turn out on the backside. And in that case, God is creating a faith promotion where he's moving you from this life that's scarred with sin and stained with pain and you move from fire to fire into a new reality. You step in through the doorway to an existence with God that's bigger and better and brighter and more powerful than you could ever experience. When people move from this body to the next body, when we move from death to life, God has bigger and better plans. It's a faith promotion for us and this is good news, amen? Now, you'll notice that regardless of what happens in the fire, regardless of what God chooses, there's always something happening deeper to your faith. You guys notice that in the pattern? You got a faith booster, a faith deepener, and a faith promotion. And that's because because God is more concerned with your inner journey than with your outer comfort. That's the truth to take home with you today. God is more concerned with your inner journey than your outer comfort. He's concerned more about the person that you are becoming, who is the person that's going to last forever and ever, amen, than he is the comfort of the 80 or so years that you spend rotating, revolving around the sun. Now, this is a hard thing to say when you're in the middle of pain. (laughs) In the middle of pain, you go, I just want relief. Sometimes you just want option A, God, please take the pain away. But seek God in the midst of this, because he's at work deeply, whether it's A or B or C. So let's get back to our story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves to you in this matter. If we're thrown in the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Oh, this is holy boldness, isn't it? To be able to say that straight to the face of the king. We believe, O king, that God will deliver us from this. We believe that plan A will happen, but even if it is plan C, we are not going to bow to the idols that you have put in front of us. This is the kind of faith that transforms human hearts and transforms human culture. It's the faith that says, I don't care what you say, I believe our God can Heal me, deliver me, put me in a new place. But my God does not have to because I ask him. That's why he's God and I'm not. He can make those choices, but my choice is that I will bow and worship him and I will not bow to anything else. 
I don't care if you squash me, oppress me, cancel me, taunt me, make fun of me, throw me in jail, or kill me. I will not bow down to your gods. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have got this going right. It's powerful. That Nebuchadnezzar was furious <laughs> with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you think? And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. Now, I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had thought that option A might be a possibility. They thought option C might be a possibility, but they never thought that option B would be what would happen. That God would actually leave the throne room of heaven to walk in the fire with them. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between where I used to be and this reckoning either
is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There is a Isn't that a truth you want to bring home with you today? <laughs> There's another one in the fire, and he's standing right next to you. Whenever you go through the fire, you need to remember you are not abandoned, you are not alone. There is another one who is standing with you right there in the fire. And there's another truth I want you to grab onto as well. And I hope you noticed this in the text as we went through it. And it's a truth that was wrapped up in a single word he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed. Did you notice that word, unbound? Oh, don't miss that in this passage. Because we'll find out later that these guys were not burned. Their skin wasn't burned, their cloaks weren't burned, their beards weren't burned, their hair wasn't burned. The only thing that burned in the fire was the ropes that bound them. The truth of the matter is God takes you through the fire because he wants to unbind the ropes that have bound you for your life. And sometimes our skulls are so thick and sometimes our patterns are so ingrained and sometimes we're so deeply into something that's hurtful to us and those who are around us that God takes us through the fire because he wants to burn the bonds that have bound us for our entire life. I don't know what it is for you, but maybe God wants to release you from selfishness. Maybe he wants to release you from wounds of your past, from self-reliance, from independence, from workaholism, from wrong priorities, from being earthly minded. But I know that he unbinds people in the fire. Verse 25, he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Fourth man, who is that? Who is that? Well, the truth is there's two theories that scholars talk about. One theory is that it's the angel Gabriel, and the other one is that it is a theophany. Those who go on the angel Gabriel side of things will emphasize, well, Nebuchadnezzar said he's like a son of the gods, not that he is God. And later on, Nebuchadnezzar uses a reference to an angel. And so they kind of get their theology from, uh, you know, the pagan king's perspective on what's happening. Don't trust pagan kings to give you theological information, just as a, a side note. But it's actually a legitimate view that's out there that especially a lot of Jewish rabbis will hold as they take a look at this passage. Others say that this is a theophany. And the word theophany comes from two words. Theo means God and phano means to appear. It's an appearance of God. Everybody say the word theophany. Theophany. And the idea is that this is an appearance before, of God before Jesus showed up on planet Earth. It might be the Son, it might be the Holy Spirit, but it's God showing up before Jesus came and was incarnated. And this sons of God part of this, he looked like a son of the gods, sometimes is translated that he is a son of God. And I just think that this phrasing is way too specific to be an accident. Whether it was Nebuchadnezzar who uh, uh, we're talking about or the person who wrote the book of Daniel, they may not have been aware 
that it was a pre-incarnate form of God coming to the planet, but I think God was. And I think God is kind of winking at us through the text as he says, hey, guess who was in the fire? I like this interpretation as well because it's a lot like God. This is not the only theophany we see in the scriptures. We see God showing up over and over through the scriptures. To Moses, God showed up as the burning bush. To the wandering Israelites, he was a pillar of cloud and fire. To Abraham, he was the voice that stopped the knife. To Jacob, he was a nighttime wrestler. To Joshua, he was the commander of the Lord's army. To Elijah, he was a still small voice. To Solomon, he was a dream saying, ask me anything. To Balaam, Hagar, and 60 other times, he was the angel of the Lord. To Hezekiah, he was the one who slaughtered the Assyrian army. To Job, he was a tempest and a tornado. To our three heroes, he was the fourth man in the fire. God shows up in history, and he shows up in your life as well. He loves you. He has plans for you, and he has plans for your pain. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. He he calls them all by name, but did you notice he didn't call the shiny guy to come out? Hey, you three come out here. That other guy, that, uh, you, yeah, son of the gods, you can just stay in there. You're good. You're good. But it's bigger than even that. Because we see the rescue of our three heroes in this moment. But do you realize that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the story of the flaming furnace is actually a picture of the meta story of the Bible. It's a picture of the gospel. Because in this story... God sees some of his people in trouble. He says, I will leave the throne room of heaven in order to enter the fire of earth. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? He came into our fire. He took on our pains. He had our body complete with bunions and body odor and the flu and all the stuff that came with that. And he went through our pains. In fact, he went through our death in order to rescue us from the fire. And then... His plan is to promote us to be co-rulers with him in the new heavens and the new earth for all eternity. God enters the fire, he rescues us from the fire, and he promotes us to to rule with him. This is good news, amen? amen? This is the story the Bible tells over and over again. God rescues and he raises us up to rule with him. No wonder we don't bow to any other gods because nobody saves like Jesus saves, amen? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. Dudes, what happened in there? They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. I love that detail, don't you? They didn't even smell like fire when they came out. When I go out in my backyard and I'm smoking a pork shoulder, I come out of that smelling like pulled pork. My hair, my eyebrows, my clothes, you can tell I've been smoking meat. But these guys walked out of a furnace and they didn't even smell like smoke. Have you ever noticed people like that? People who have been through a fire and you meet them? And you see their character and their demeanor, and they don't smell like the fire at all. In fact, they don't even smell like smoke. You're like, man, you've been through that level of abuse, and you've still got that depth of kindness? You've been betrayed that hard, and you're still making friends? You've been oppressed by people unfairly, and yet you still love to the depths of your being? Man, you don't even smell like smoke. That's the kind of God that we have. The God who takes us through fires, heals us on the inside, makes us more like Jesus so that we get to the backside and we do not even smell like smoke. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and rescued his servants. 
They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. He's given kudos to them now. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. This guy's a drama king no matter what, isn't it? Like one, I'm gonna burn you in the furnace if you don't, I'm gonna cut you up if you do. For no other God can save this way. No other God can save this way. Now, the courageous actions of three young men are not just affecting the three young men and the people who are immediately there, they're affecting the entire area, the entire city of Babylon. God is not just saving people, he's reaching Babylon and he's promoting people. Chapter 3, verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. He's raising them up as rulers, just as God is going to raise us up to co-rule with him for all eternity. See, God's not just forming his people, he's reaching Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, we see, actually takes a step of faith. Did you notice this? He actually moves from, you can only bow to my God, to, oh, nope, your God is actually more real. I mean, building a statue is impressive. Surviving a fiery furnace is really, really impressive. So your God must be real. And we see Nebuchadnezzar, interestingly, taking multiple steps in his spiritual journey as you read through the book of Daniel. And this is one. In fact, he says, not only am I taking this step of faith, everybody should, and nobody can say anything bad about this God, because I don't want him opening up a can on me and Babylon. This God is real. So friends, I want to encourage you. When you choose not to bow, it impacts those around you. Your courageous stands of faith against the tide of culture will not only result in your spiritual formation, But it will also be something that stands out to every authority figure. Every onlooker will notice that your life is different. When we refuse to bow to idols and go through the fire with the fourth man, our lives look different, we feel different, and we walk away and don't even smell like smoke. (laughs) Let's stand together and invite God to bless us through prayer. Thanks so much, God, for your message of the courage of three young men in Babylon and the ways that you use them to accomplish your purposes in this world. We pray that you would use us, men and women, ordinary people, high school students, 20-something, seniors. God, use us all to accomplish your purposes here in this world. Give us the grace to be courageous in our stands of faith, to not bow down to idols, and to be a witness to those who are around us. We're so glad, God, that you've given us the fourth man in the furnace in order to walk with us through this. And we look forward to your rescue, we look forward to your rule, and we look forward to the life that you've planned for us that includes episodes in the fire that we might look more like Jesus and be unbound from the things that have kept us in our past. We pray this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. amen, amen. God bless you guys. Hey, thank you again for engaging with us today from wherever in the world you are at. And one of our hopes is that this ministered to you in some way. And we would love to hear about that and celebrate how God is using this content. If you would send us an email online at cccomaha.org, that would be awesome to hear your story. Or if you're on YouTube, you can just drop that in the comments so we can celebrate how God is using this in your life. We'll see you soon.